the world's most honored watch is Longines. Longines watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals and more honors for accuracy than any other timepiece. Longines, the world's most honored watch, is made and guaranteed by the Longines Whitnall Watch Company. It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnall Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnall, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. Mr. Fraser Hunt, famous American journalist, magazine writer and commentator. And Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Mr. Henry Grady, United States ambassador recently returned from Iran. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. Ambassador Grady, our Chronoscope audience <clears throat> has heard several oil men in the last few weeks on the Iranian situation. Tonight, our audience, I'm sure, can get some real inside authoritative information from you, sir. Now, when did you go to Iran as our ambassador? In June 1950. And uh, in June <coughs> 1950, sir, uh, did you as our ambassador or did our embassy there understand what was likely to, to happen? Did you foresee the developments? We realized the great importance of a settlement on the oil question. We felt that that was basic to any economic measures we might take to uh, aid the country and uh, stem the trend toward communism. And did you alert our State Department? Naturally. And uh, at that time, uh, what was your analysis of the situation? Did you think that, uh, uh, that definite action should be taken by the British or by ourselves? The uh, Iranian government had before it, uh, before its parliament, a supplementary agreement to the uh, agreement which they had signed uh, in 1933 with the Iranian government, uh, which provided for an increase in the royalties. That had been signed but not ratified and to have the royalties become effective it was necessary to have it ratified so it was already over a year from the time of signing when we arrived what was the percent that they uh, had originally paid and were trying to get an agreement to pay at that time about 13 to 15 percent the original uh, the original and the supplemental the agreement would uh, have about doubled that to 25 to 30. Well, what were we paying at that time the american oil companies paying, uh, for instance, in, to Saudi Arabia. Well, shortly after that time, uh, we went on a 50-50 basis, which was an increase over what we had been paying. Uh, not, a, not a large increase, but a substantial increase. A considerable increase, increase yes. So that they were going to pay about a, a little over half what we agreed to That's pay. correct. For our audience, sir, I'd like to review that. Uh, the British had been paying about 13%. And they were offering to pay it to, from 25 to 30 yes. percent. And during that same period, the United States was paying a higher rate of royalty to the Middle Eastern countries. That's correct. And is it your opinion, sir, that the British uh, were at fault in not uh, meeting our terms in the Middle East? It wasn't so much a question of meeting the terms regarding royalties, but it was a matter of making uh, a number of non-monetary concessions. Uh, Rasmara came in as Prime Minister in June, short a few days before I arrived. And he was very anxious to get this supplementary agreement ratified. And I believe that if the uh, British company had been willing to grant him some non-monetary non concessions, he could have gotten it ratified by the Parliament and the whole oil question, at least for the time being, would have been settled. I see. Now, then non-monetary, you mean questions of face and other concessions that would have kept him... I mean, for example, more, employing more Iranians in the plants, a matter of uh, the prices charged for uh, oil products within Iran, the... Uh, the amounts of, of the production of the company sold in Iran was only 5%, and we felt they could easily have 
given the same prices that uh, they were giving elsewhere. By elsewhere, I mean to the British Navy and to the British Air Force. As, uh, as American ambassador, did you uh, urge the British to make those concessions, yes, sir? Yes, very strongly. And you feel that had those concessions been made that we might have avoided uh, some of this uh, yes. crisis? Yes, there's no assurance, of course, but I think it would have made it possible to get the supplemental agreement ratified and the whole atmosphere would have been cleared and this nationalization movement would not have started. That only came along six months after Asmara was prime minister, in other words, in the fall of 1950, in winter of 1950. Well, the liberal uh, labor government uh, in uh, London uh, weren't uh, very active in enforcing the uh, a new settlement that would have, be, have been considered fair by the Iranians, were they? They didn't seem to be very anxious with regard to the nationalization of the oil industry in Iran. They finally accepted a nationalization, but for some time they were hesitant. Now, Mr. Ambassador, our audience has heard this term nationalization used over and over. Now, by nationalization, do you mean confiscation? Is that what it amounts to in, in, the, in the Middle East? It shouldn't mean that. Nationalization <laughs> should carry with it the obligation for adequate compensation for the properties taken. Have the Iranians offered to pay the British for these properties? In the, yes. In the law which was passed, there was provision for setting aside 25% of the proceeds of, uh, from the oil operation for paying British claims. The British were con have been concerned that the company would not make profits under Iranian operation and hence have had no assurance that they would get payment for their properties. Can you illustrate for us, sir, uh, just how important this matter is to the American people? Now, what is the oil potential in the Middle, in the, in the Middle East, for instance, sir? How can you illustrate the importance of this for Americans? Iran itself produces about 6% of the world production of oil products. It has uh, reserves in terms of, of world reserves of about 17%. The rest of the area around the Persian Gulf has reserves of about 50% of the world's known reserves. In other words, almost half of the world's known Precisely. reserve is in this area. Yes, and consequently it's of vital importance for the future. Uh, in any terms you may think of, in industrialization, warfare, whatever you may. But interpret. in the public uh, mind, uh, Ambassador Grady, it seems to me that uh, the biggest fear that we have in this country is the intrusion of Russia into this picture. Now, uh, how, uh, how would Russia get this oil out? Say that, that uh, we went from one failure to another and uh, Russia, there was a coup d'etat and the Russian group would get in control of the government. How, how could Russia really manage to get this, this oil out? It's if a long ways to the Black Sea. Yes. Uh, <coughs> if a government friendly to Russia came in as a result of a coup, uh, an agreement could be made for the sale of the oil with the Russian government. And the oil could be, uh, a considerable quantity could be gotten out. There is a lot of oil stored in the tanks at the port of Koromshaw, and it could be moved by tankers and by uh, overland, by trucks uh, in, uh, in containers. Uh, I don't uh, think that you could move all the oil that was produced uh, under normal conditions in Iran, but I think a considerable amount, uh, at least an amount that would be embarrassing to us, Six percent, you say, uh, altogether, and Russia has about the same... Uh, about the same percentage, yes. But uh, they couldn't uh, hope to take out more mm. than, say, 25 percent, could oh, they? Oh, no, they, uh, they couldn't uh, hope to take out... Uh, in the first place, I doubt if, unless there's a British company or some kind of a company goes in to operate and produce and, and sell to the market they've sold to in the past, I, do, I don't think that uh, the, the Russians could get any of the oil. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, this interesting uh, old gentleman, uh, Mr. Mossadegh, is now a visitor in the United States. Do you know him personally, sir? Yes, extremely well. Uh, is he an able and responsible statesman? He's extremely able. He's a patriot. I think he's misguided in the way he's carrying out the nationalization program. I've told him that a number of times. 
And I've told him that as a friend of Iran, because I think a failure of this uh, uh, program of his may be very harmful to his country. And a failure to make some kind of an agreement with responsible management, some responsible management company to operate, because I, I doubt that the Iranians themselves can operate this industry. Uh, he's, he's, he's honest. Uh, he's uh, one, of the, uh, one of the ablest speakers in the country. Very attractive personality, good sense of humor. Is he? Uh, He's a Persian gentleman. Is he a prisoner of uh, of the nationalistic wave there, or this revolt against the against the West? Uh, the, to a degree, that may be so. Uh, not to a very great degree, because the Mossadegh is a man of great force himself, great willpower. He's not. Uh, he's not easily influenced by anybody. Is he, well, we is he his own man here? Yes. Is he capable in, uh, to, of making a, a settlement here in the United States? Well, uh, uh, he's taken such a strong position that it re would be difficult for him to change his position. But uh, that's because of his, uh, of his own, from his own angle. Uh, he's the man who makes the decisions. He's all the right. man who's made them right along. And, and, sir, are you hopeful from all your knowledge, are you hopeful uh, of a settlement there? There is an, uh, a common interest, a mutual interest, on the, on the part of both sides to get a settlement of this question. When you have a situation of that kind, there's always hope of a settlement. I see, sir. For, but well, I am sir, not signed see, because well, the two I'm, sides I'm, are too far apart. What is I the see, percent sir, so of the... Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. Mr. Hunt. I'm afraid that that's our time is up. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for being with us. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. Fraser Hunt and Mr. William Bradford Huey. Our distinguished guest was Mr. Henry Grady, our recent ambassador to Iran. The worldwide prestige of Longines watches is proof of their unsurpassed dependability and accuracy. These qualities are the result of the extraordinary excellence in design and manufacture of the Longines watch movement, the beating heart of every Longines watch. Here is the matured product of the skills and experience acquired through 85 years of watchmaking. The ultra slow motion camera reveals a smooth, flawless mechanism of the Longines balance assembly, the guardian of the accuracy of the watch. Through his magnifying glass, the skilled watchmaker sees in addition the precious hand finishing of essential parts, which makes the Longines watch so superior, so outstanding. Yes, there are tangible reasons why Longines watches have won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and so many honors for accuracy in fields of precise timing. Now, when next you buy a watch for yourself or as a gift, remember, if you pay $71.50 or more for a watch, you're paying the price of a Longines. And you should insist on getting a Longines, the world's most honored watch, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. This is Frank Knight, again reminding you that the Longines Chronoscope is brought to you three times weekly, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So won't you join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for The Longine Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longine, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, a distinguished companion to the world-honored Longine, sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display the emblem Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. This is the CBS Television Network.